Good morning. Um, I hope everyone can hear me this morning. Um, and thank you for joining us here at the EVPA Bates World discussion, dealing with distress, the impact investors dilemma. Um, uh, we might as well make a, make a start here. Um, I know more people will join. I normally kind of average in at about two or three minutes after start time. So we can get going just a little bit ahead of time. Um, my name is Peter Kafferke. I'm the UK and Ireland lead for EVPA. And also, as I look at our slides, the grandly titled chair for this discussion as well. Um, what that actually means in practice is I get the honor of taking you through the agenda and some housekeeping items before handing over to our expert speakers to hear from them as well. Um, so just to, to make sure we're all on the same page and everyone understands the, the, the situation, uh, you will have all joined this webinar, which is being recorded. Um, you'll be automatically on mute uh, as you enter. That's purely so that we can keep the sound to a, a nice level. And as we go through the agenda, we will try and bring you into the discussion as we go along, because this very much is a round table rather than a one-way conversation. We want to hear from the expertise that we know is in the audience today as we go into some knotty issues. So maybe a good place to start is just to share with you the agenda for today. Um, I think uh, this shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone, but after my uh, quick welcome, we've got colleagues at Bates Wells to help set the scene around the legal and practical issues of dealing with uh, investees that, that are in distress and, and, and struggling, um, followed up by some real expertise and case studies, firstly from uh, Nick Temple, uh, CEO at Social Investment Business, and secondly, from Martin Lawson, Head of Impact and Innovation at Resonance. Um, looking at this agenda, you'll notice we've put in uh, short Q and A's after each presentation, but we've also kept uh, a decent amount of time at the end for group discussion, because as I say, this is very much about getting your input and getting your discussion. Um, we want to hear from you. You won't be surprised to hear we've got one or two questions already lined up in case you're feeling shy, but there is, there is really a lot of, uh, interest and experience in the audience, so we'd like to hear from you as well. On a practical note, how we're actually going to make that work is for the shorter Q&A sessions, um, we're going to try and focus mostly on the chat box, which you'll see uh, normally on your right-hand side. Feel free to share any questions, comments, thoughts as we go along, and we can, we can stop for Q&As there, and my colleague Gail, who's behind the scenes, will help share that with the panelists. Um, and then as we move towards the end in the group discussion, we'll try and bring you in uh, possibly using a raising hand system to actually hear from you you each to, to share your points and discussions. That also works well for me because I actually get my best questions about 10 minutes after every presentation is finished, so feel free to go back to anything that's been said earlier. Um, before handing over to colleagues at Bateswells, I just very quickly wanted to share with you why EVPA is, is really very happy to be hosting this, this event alongside Batesfields and thinks it's an important discussion. I mean, for those of you who don't know us, uh, EVPA is the European Venture Philanthropy Association. Um, we're the leading network for investors for impact across Europe. Um, and we're a broad church of over 300 members who range from corporate foundations to traditional grant makers to impact funds, but all united by this one, one ideal of, of trying to achieve impact. And so, over the last 18 months, we've worked quite hard with our members to try and understand what it is they believe marks them out as investors for impact, uh, following an idea of more show, not tell. So what are the behaviors? Get away from what the financial instruments might be or what your uh, techniques for measurement are. What are the things that you see identifying yourself as an investor for impact? And late last year, we launched the charter, which you'll see in front of you now. Um, and this came from working with our members as the 10 behaviors that they see showing themselves as investors for impact. And so as we were talking with, with colleagues at Bates, uh, actually at the last event pre the UK lockdown, um, it was very much around two issues here that, that came out. So for me and from an EVPA point of view, the idea of putting the final beneficiary at the center of the solution and also upholding high ethical standards are two points that whilst could be seen as slightly generic almost, and we would all like to aim for those. They are also things that are very easy to do at the start of programs or to put down when you're planning programs and become a lot more complicated when things go a little bit wrong or things get more complicated and you're dealing with multiple stakeholders, you're dealing with uh, the difference between one investee surviving and a portfolio doing good returns and how you balance those, those issues. So 
from our point of view, we very much want to start that discussion here. We want to see if there's best practices that can be shared. And also because you can't get away from the, the COVID uh, situation, um, we also have to be uh, honest that we're probably going to be facing more of these difficult decisions as the economic uh, situation worsens post-COVID. So that's where EVPA is coming from this. It's hopes that to start this discussion and share some real best practices. But And after that very brief whistle-stop tour of our charter, um, I'll then hand over to Louise and Sunday to take forward with some real scene setting on the legal and practical elements of this area. Thank you, Peter. Hi, everyone, and thank you for dialing in. Um, I'm Louise Harmon, a partner at Bates Wells, um, and I'm going to be talking with Sunghair Park uh, about um, the key legal and practical issues to consider in the sort of impact investors dilemma. Um, we'll be setting the scene, um, but we really want to hear from as many as you, of you as possible in the group discussion. Um, so we'll be talking for about 20 minutes with five minutes at the end for a quick Q&A on this topic, but there will be longer time at the end for the group discussion as set out by Peter. We'll keep it as high level as possible so people don't blaze over before we get to the more interesting case studies. So on the next slide, you can see that the um, obviously the most common issues at the moment, as soon as the crisis has hit, has been cash flow. Um, and you can see, um, obviously, charities have been hit by loss of trading and fundraising income and by loss of volunteers. And the top slide, top half of the slide shows what borrowers may be thinking about, some of the key issues they're thinking about their cash flow. And the bottom half shows what lenders may be thinking about or investors. Um, the things they're thinking about in relation to their investment documentation. So in normal times, formal insolvency always comes at the end of a period of declining business performance, financial distress and cash flow crisis. So there's typically three quite distinct phases to the decline of a company. So underperformance, distress and crisis. In the context of the coronavirus um, pandemic, this timeline may be radically compressed, so we could see a borrower going from trading as normal one week to zero trade or operations the next week, which means that things can move from underperformance to crisis really fast. Um, and then on the next slide, um, this is really a more sort of deeper dive into the main areas in a, a loan agreement where the borrower may go into default. So I don't propose to go through all of these in detail, but I'll just pick out some of the key ones. Um, and obviously the key issue we're seeing quite often is um, defaulting in repayment, whether that's interest or principal due to short term cash flow issues. Um, for some, it may not be happening yet, and it may be that the sort of cash flow crunch is going to come in a few months. Um, but it's particularly relevant where there may be borrowers who were already struggling before the crisis. Um, there could be breaches of representations, um, for example, breaches that um, there's no default or potential default are likely to trigger. And there also may be an inability to provide accurate information um, fast at the moment, given that things are moving so fast. Um, financial covenants, again, are a key area, particularly covenants that are tested on a look forward basis. Um, they'll be particularly relevant, including the cash flow covenant. So a long calculation period may help to smooth out short term difficulties for a borrower in, good, in otherwise good health. Um, but a short, um, a, sh a short calculation period will obviously highlight any defaults that are going to arise. Um, in terms of undertakings, problems with providing financial accounts or cash flow forecasts at the moment is obviously very difficult to predict with certainty um, cash flow and where income is going to come from. It's sort of a finger in the air exercise at the moment. So, um, and another key area, particularly for impact investment transactions, will be meeting key performance indicators and impact targets. Um, there could be restrictions because of lockdown that are impacting um, an ability to meet those targets. And then uh, finally, in terms of the events of default, uh, things like cross default are likely to be breached. Um, change in service delivery may become an issue as 
um, organisations adapt um, to provide new areas of service delivery. There could be material adverse change clauses that could be triggered, although those are notoriously difficult to invoke and an investor may be wary of the reputational damage in invoking those, particularly during a, a global pandemic. Um, and of course, insolvency, um, insolvency um, covenants may trigger if it does get to that stage. So I'm going to pass on to Sung Hare, who will talk briefly about the remedies available to lenders. Thank you, Louise. So what we have provided here is, is just a very short overview of some of the um, technical and contractual remedies that are available to all investors, not just impact investors. Um, and you know, all of you uh, will pretty much uh, probably be familiar with those, but just to counter through those quickly. Um, if you have a borrower in difficulty, then obviously you could amend the relevant terms of the documents that are in breach or waive them. You could provide additional funding for investees to support their cash flow issues. This could be by way of providing further funding uh, under your existing loan uh, or separate financing in terms of bridge loans um, to help borrower unlock capital by way of providing guarantees, etc. Um, for all investors, there is the option of requesting additional collateral um, protection. So requesting guarantees from parents, uh, from individual directors, or to request more security from the borrower or other entities within the borrower group. Um, if things are getting to kind of the crunch stage, um, then you could look into exiting your investment, you know, refinancing with um, a different uh, organisation who is willing to take on that greater risk, or to restructure the terms of, of the debt or the borrower's entire financial package more fundamentally. Um, and when you are going to get into Armageddon stage, then you could be looking to enforce your security and guarantees, uh, which if you have a debenture, essentially means pushing the borrower into some form of insolvency if you're taking over and then selling most of their assets. So a lot of this will already be familiar with you, but the purpose of this is to recap the kind of remedies are available to all investors and then obviously the question which is more interesting which we'll go on to is how as impact investors do you exercise those rights in a way that may be different to normal investors um, if we could go on to the next slide please thank you so again um, we touched on some of the kind of contractual um, practical things that you can do as all investors to protect your position um, some of the considerations that may apply to all investors, again, not just impact ones, are, are things such as intercreditor arrangements. So if you are a junior lender uh, in particular um, and you have security over your debt and there are other lenders in the structure, especially those that are more senior to you, then what you can actually do in practice can be constrained by the terms of your intercreditor arrangements. And those are called by lots of different names, deeds of priority, subordination agreement, intercreditor agreement. And those can impose restrictions on what you can do by, for example, um, restricting how you can amend or waive the terms of your document. Uh, if you, there's a breach under the terms of your loan or another uh, financing, which is subject to the terms of the intercreditor, then there could be a payment block on what you could receive. So there are these kind of considerations which will be a constraint to you. Um, in practice, if you do have an intercreditor of some sort in place with an investee borrower. There are also kind of insolvency law considerations, and I'm conscious that uh, given that this is a, a jointly a host of our table with the EVPA, there may be members of the EVPA present which are not uh, based in the UK and may be based in other jurisdictions. And the insolvency law is, of course, different for each jurisdiction, but there will be constraints, especially when a borrower is coming close to insolvency or financial difficulty as to how a lender or an investor can act. So there are things, for example, in the UK uh, where when the borrower gets to a certain point, they can't prefer certain creditors over another. And that goes to things like what security you can give. Um, you can't enter into transactions at an undervalue at uh, terms that are lower than arm's length. So these kind of things are mitigated to some degree uh, by government measures. So in the UK, you have the recent insolvency bill, which has relaxed the insolvency wrongful trading uh, provisions on directors so that they can continue to trade um, despite making losses up to the period of 31st of June. Um, and this is to encourage directors to continue 
not taking risks, but continue working hard to try to ensure the survival of the company. And there are other measures like that in the UK, which may be replicated in other jurisdictions to try to um, uh, protect and to encourage the survival of, of companies in the UK, despite the pandemic. So intercreditor and insolvency concerns at a very, very high level are things impacting all investors in terms of how they consider dealing with restructurings and dealing with um, borrowers in distress. And also, yeah, I've just recapped on some of the rights that investors have, um, which are across the board, depending regardless of what kind of investor you may be. So um, for all investors, again, there will be reputational issues and, and relationships with various stakeholders at stake. Um, and this kind of constant need to balance uh, different competing interests, which become even more pressing given the social impact nature of the borrower, uh, the nature of the beneficiaries and the work that you are trying to do and what your investees are trying to do. So um, on that note, I'll pass back over to Louise um, to kick off the discussion on what makes impact investors different in their approach. Thank you. So this slide really sets out the crux of the dilemma, which is the sort of topic of this webinar. How far should the flexibility of impact investors go? And what about their own obligations to their own stakeholders? and their own survival, ultimately. Um, so we've seen in the market a real emphasis on impact investors taking a creative and collaborative approach during this period. For example, we've seen some investors offering a platform for investees to talk to each other for support. I know Big Society Capital are sharing a lot of information across their portfolios to share some examples of preemptive actions that are being taken. Um, and in the UK, over 30 social investors have issued a statement which emphasises the aim to be as flexible as possible. Um, and, and I know a number of the social investors are dialed into this webinar and, and um, uh, SIB and Resonance are also party to this statement. So it would be really helpful to hear from you all about how this is being put into practice um, in more tangible ways. Um, but really, I suppose this slide is just to, to create some discussion around how far should this flexibility go? Um, and so some key questions may be, you may be thinking about when you're thinking about how to act collaboratively and creatively is who, who is the borrower, what type of business are they, what are their purposes and outlooks and drivers, and what is your relationship with the borrower, is it a long relationship, have you got a long history of working together, uh, when, what is the purpose of the finance you've provided, um, so if, for example, a breach of a financial covenant may not feel that material in the short term if the organisation is, is able to continue to deliver impact or potentially able to meet new demands during the crisis. And that's something we'll touch on later as well, the, the sort of new opportunities that are arising as a result of the crisis. What will be the reputational impact on you? As Sun has already said, reputation has a huge part in in what, what actions you may be thinking about taking as, a, as an investor. Um, so taking harsh measures like enforcing security or commencing insolvency proceedings may just not feel right in terms of your moral and ethical obligations you have, particularly in an impact investment. Um, and then who are your external stakeholders and what are their requirements and what's the dialogue you've had with them so far? What is your long-term priority and strategy? Um, and your sort of short-term strategy in relation to the crisis. Um, so we'd generally be expecting investors to try to maximise the impact of investment portfolios during what is expected to be a severe recession. Um, and it's also important to be alive to any new opportunities and sectors with greatest need at the moment. So our understanding is that a lot of investors at the moment are sort of taking a bit of a balancing act between their traditional strategy uh, taking a flexible approach to borrowers in crisis and looking at any new investment needs to quickly provide urgent capital through a more streamlined process. So we'll look a bit more at what this flexibility may look like in practice and somehow we'll have a look at this on the next slide. Thank you Louise. So um, just staying on this slide which is um, what could this look like in practice. Um, yeah and this is supposed to set the scene so you may already be doing um, a lot if not all of, of, of these steps that we are talking about and it would be great to hear your thoughts at the general discussion stage or at the Q&A stage as to what you are seeing, what you are doing, what you think works and what you think perhaps doesn't in, in terms of sharing kind of knowledge within the group. So some of the kind of 
things that you could do um, are more kind of relational, I suppose, rather than anything specifically contractual. So communication, of course, is key, um, not just in relation to investees that actually have approached you because they are in difficulty, but those, but across your whole, whole portfolio, if resources um, allow to see how they are doing, where they anticipate their pressure points to be, and how you can perhaps preemptively act to, to, to support them. And obviously keeping that kind of communication going um, throughout this difficult period. Um, a lot of it will be about messaging and reassurance to the extent that you are reasonably able to provide that reassurance and, and what your kind of way forward will be. Um, we touch upon this a little bit later, but this really does tie into considering what the overall aims of any restructuring um, are for you. You know, what are the goals um, that you are trying to achieve with restructuring or your approach to borrowers and difficulties as a whole? So um, we, um, we, we kind of drew inspiration, shall we say, from, from what um, Nick and uh, the social investment business team uh, put together for the Resilience and Recovery Loan Fund, which is one of the case studies that we will come to in terms of their kind of three priorities for aims of restructuring, um, being kind of cash flow for long term survival. So those who are experiencing very immediate cash flow challenges. Um, one is the maintenance um, of support to enable uh, borrowers who are providing social impact uh, services to maintain and perhaps deal with increased demand uh, for their services if they are in specific sectors which have experienced uh, greater pressures as a result of the pandemic. And the last one um, is revival, so helping uh, borrowers to revive and to thrive post-pandemic uh, by supporting staff and assets until uh, service delivery can resume. And we've seen kind of various um, different approaches to these three uh, types of restructuring in slightly different formats, uh, but this, these do seem to be kind of some of the key themes. Um, as a little kind of mini case study from what we've seen from impact investors directly, um, we know, for example, uh, that CDC, and I know that Matt from CDC is, is, is on the call, um, uh, always due to join, it is, is one of the things that they have really been quite express about is the focus on job security as part of their response to the pandemic. So that CDC um, invests primarily in Africa and South Asia. Um, they have really prioritized the possible devastating impacts on job losses um, if their investees go under. So they have not just focused on um, protecting investees to ensure job survival in their individual portfolios, but have also um, shared wider resources to investors um, in relation to strategies and ways to encourage uh, a job security and have shared um, those materials so that other investors can, can consider these kind of considerations when, when um, reacting flexibly to, um, to borrowers. And, and briefly to touch on other forms of support, um, obviously you've got the financial support by way of additional funding, grants, et cetera, but you also have non-financial support, which is really important. So um, especially if you're on the board of an investee providing support that way, but also through the release of information, sharing of information and, and public, um, publicizing some of the kind of initiatives and ideas and practical tips that investors and investees can go on to. Um, I think um, Louise is gonna go on to a few more um, possibilities in terms of reacting uh, creatively to uh, investees in difficulty. Thank you, Sangha. So. What, what we think is unique about the impact investment market is the potential for restructuring terms to be based upon both financial and social impact metrics. So we thought it would be helpful to set out a few potential options as a recap, but again, we'd be really interested in hearing from you during the group discussion about what you're seeing and what, how you're approaching your restructuring terms. So um, one option is extension of maturity date. We've seen this in quite a few transactions in the market. So the growth fund, for example, are offering term extensions. Um, in relation to impact, if there's a service delivery or impact measurement challenge, uh, the simplest way can often be for the parties to deal with this by amending the documentation to extend maturity until normal service delivery can be resumed. Um, and in many cases, it may be that the priorities in service delivery may need to adapt to meet the most vulnerable needs at the moment. Um, so this could involve a change in the profile of beneficiaries or the type of social issue the intervention is designed to deal with. 
So in these circumstances, the parties may negotiate amendments to the key performance indicators or add in additional ones which better reflect the adapted services. In terms of financial obligations, again, we've seen a lot in the market in terms of delaying or deferring interest or principal repayments to help build up cash flow for short term challenges. There's a lot of capital repayment holidays that we've seen offered in the market. Um, and we're really interested to hear of examples of restructuring, which is conditional on certain impacts being achieved. So that impact is part of the restructuring deal. Um, for example, the parties could negotiate interest rates or principal reductions linked to impact that's achieved. Um, we've seen this on, on some transactions bef before the crisis, and obviously it incentivizes greater impact because the more impact you achieve, the lower your repayment obligations are. Um, and in terms of sort of repayment holidays, um, it would be interested to hear if there's any sort of levels of financial performance that's been introduced so that the borrower has a sort of reassurance about when they're going to be asked to repay and it's based on their financial performance. Um, so they've got a capital buffer before they before they actually due to repay any obligations. Um, so Sunghair will finish off uh, with looking at some key institutional constraints before we wrap up uh, with questions. Thanks, Louise. So I'm very conscious of, of timing um, and, um, and that we uh, should probably wrap up uh, fairly soon. So I will just summarise these more in the form of questions, really, um, in terms of um, some of the challenges that we're aware for all investors, but particularly pressing perhaps for impact investors in, in trying to achieve this more flexible, creative approach to being patient with your investees. So one question is, what is the level of your institutional risk tolerance? There are some um, factors which might mitigate this. So for example, for the uh, Resilience and Recovery Loan Fund, which Nick will go on to talk about, we are conscious that the level of risk tolerance for um, lenders is mitigated by the fact that the loans are covered by the government's coronavirus business interruption loan scheme, so SIBLs, um, which helps to cover of 80% uh, of individual defaults by borrowers, for example, but not all impact investors will be uh, in the same position to be able to do that. Um, another question which relates to internal policy is what is the percentage of acceptable write-offs um, across your portfolio and is there a scope for that to be more flexible to be changed in order to preserve impact and the survival of investees? Um, another key question is can you manage expectations of external and internal stakeholders? And they may not um, just involve um, your shareholders, but also your own investors, um, those who are collaborating with you. So have you faced any key challenges on, on that front? Have you had any, any success stories to share of how you have successfully managed uh, to manage those relationships? So um, another practical example is that Big Society Capital, um, who are funding social investors uh, for uh, the Growth Fund, which is a scheme to provide blended loans and grant finance uh, to smaller charities and uh, social enterprises, which is run by Access, uh, the Foundation for Social Investment. Um, Big Society Capital has recently announced um, a, a payment holiday, I understand, in terms of interest for the social investors who are partaking in this scheme. So BSC funds these social investors who then make loans to charities and social enterprises. Um, BSC have also relaxed certain covenants um, and indicators um, uh, for the terms for the social investors to query whether that kind of flexibility could be shown to your own investors, uh, by your own investors, um, if you are under pressure from them on that front. Um, and then in terms of the other points that we flagged, determine acceptable red flag thresholds or where restructuring isn't possible. You know, you know, this is kind of echoing what Louise said before, how far do you go? How far have you gone in providing flexibility before this becomes untenable for your business model? What do you do in terms of beneficiaries um, who would be vulnerable um, if the organisation shut down? So these are very kind of difficult questions, but ones that we would um, welcome uh, your thoughts and kind of views on. Um, I'm conscious that I have run out of time and we both have, so I think we'll probably end it there. If there's anything else that you'd like to flag, Louise, before we go into Q&A? No, that, that's it. So, so we'd love to hear any questions that anyone has. I think we've got a few minutes for questions and then we'll, we'll move on to a case study. Okay, so I have two questions here. Uh, one, uh, two of them from Takeshi. 
so one is, can you give me examples of amendments to impact metrics and also examples for impact equity investments? Okay, shall I take the impact metrics ones on here and do you want to look at the equity one? Um, yeah. So, so in terms of amendments to impact metrics, what I was really talking about there was if, if in your um, loan documentation, you've got some key performance indicators or certain impacts that need to be achieved by a certain date, um, uh, certain groups of beneficiaries who may be benefiting from those impacts. If um, during the crisis, it becomes clear that it's not going to be possible to undertake those um, that service delivery because of restrictions in lockdown, social distancing rules, um, then there may be a need to amend your impact those key performance indicators because it's not going to be possible to to meet those um, at the at the time. Um, so it's really looking at the timetables, what the um, what the targets are, and also are there any new targets that have arisen because of the crisis um, that um, where service delivery is is needed more. Uh, so those those are some of the examples of amendments to impact met metrics that we would expect to see at the moment. Does that answer your question, Takishi? Um, shall I go on to the um, impact equity investment um, part of, of Takeshi's question? So there we have we have seen um, kind of impact equity investors uh, responding in different ways to those who are in crisis. Um, I'm conscious that the, the focus of of this um, particular seminar is more on the debt investments, given the very broad scheme of um, of impact investments that you could potentially cover in a session like this. Um, what we have seen is. Um, equity uh, impact investors take various approaches. One technique that we see quite commonly is convertible loan instruments, whereby initially uh, debt is provided uh, with it converting into equity if certain thresholds are met um, in terms of performance, or underperformance rather, of um, investees. Um, in return for this additional investment, what we have seen is, for example, um, investors getting additional seats on the board, um, and this is to help the impact investor take a more full-on role in the governance and the kind of ongoing management of an investee in crisis uh, and as you'd expect lots and lots of more additional information undertakings in terms of cash flow forecasts possibly more stringent um, financial covenants but all really in the spirit of helping um, the impact investor take a more hands-on in in supporting the investee and to ensure its um, financial kind of survival so that's kind of just a few examples of, of techniques or, or um, approaches that we have seen for equity impact investors. Thank you both. Maybe we'll do one last question uh, before we move to the next speaker. So we have a question from Peter who asks, um, is there a danger that impact measurements that are put on hold never come back? And how can you ensure that that doesn't happen? I think, I mean, I think it's obviously uh, there's a lot of unknowns at the moment and people don't quite know how this uh, crisis is, is going to pan out. There seems to be a bit more certainty at the moment in terms of lockdown easing. Uh, but yes, there is potentially a, a concern around the impact being put on hold. But I think you would deal with that in the documentation by having certain dates for interim review and making sure you come together as parties, discuss what's going to be realistic and achievable to project um the impact you think you're able to have um so i think having key dates for interim review will be one of the, the ways to deal with the in uncertainty at the moment in the market so i don't know if you wanted to add anything yeah no i completely agree with that and also i think there should be um there's a degree of responsibility on the investee itself to um itself you know explain to the impact investor as to how they plan to deal with these types of concerns so as well as having kind of impact reviews um, of how they are, uh, uh, you know, achieving or progressing against their you know, existing milestones is, is their own kind of views and business plans and projections as to how they intend to deal with um, the impact over time. Um, so we've seen kind of impact you know, reviews um, go in tandem with the end of that impact review uh, being the production of a um, impact um, 
you know, report or kind of uh, forecast for a, a certain period of time thereafter in terms of the next six months or 12 months. So I think there are ways, as Louise says, that you can try to manage that as far as possible in the documentation. Thank you both. Um, okay, so I think um, uh, we have talked a, little, a lot about the theory and, and the, of the possibility. Uh, and i um, excited now to uh, hand over to um, two uh, practitioners who are very, very involved in, in implementing these in practice. So uh, we're delighted to um, introduce Nick Temple, who is the CEO of Social Investment Business, um, who provides um, a lot of support and um, you know, arranging finance for social enterprises and charities that is very deeply experienced in this field. So Nick will primarily be talking about the Resilience and Recovery Loan Fund, uh, which is a fund recently set up, uh, launched by SIB initially funded by Big Society Capital uh, to provide emergency finance uh, for charities and social enterprises who are suffering as a result of the pandemic. So over to you, Nick. Thanks very much and um, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for making the time. I know how busy everyone is at the moment and, um, and for sticking with us. So um, just before I dive into the, the fund specifically, I suppose I just wanted to give a bit of context about social investment business because I think it will help frame um, where I get to. Um, for those of you who don't know us very well, we've been around since 2002. Um, in that time, we've done around 320 million of um, lended loans, uh, almost all to charities and social enterprises, and then an additional 100 plus million of grants, um, either directly or to fund business support. Um, and we're still managing a portfolio of around sort of 50 million of investments today, both our own and, and on behalf of other people, mostly government departments. Um, that's led us to a place where um, the sort of very simple strategy you see before you um, came about. So we do three things really, we invest and manage other people's investments. Um, we partner to deliver grants and business support programs. And then we try and use data and learning from our track records since, since 2002, but also more recent work to influence uh, the sector and also inform what we should do next. Um, so that's really the, the kind of uh, what social investment business does in a nutshell. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, so I just wanted to touch on the broader context before getting into the fund. I suppose it's worth saying, I suppose, that with our existing customers, we, we moved very rapidly, uh, basically to offer repayment holidays, um, originally just for interest for three months, but actually since then, uh, we've moved to kind of largely six month, um, both capital and interest holidays. Um, and those have been taken up um, by a large proportion of, of our existing portfolio. Um, and I know that other social investors, some of whom are on the call, have done, have done similar. Um, and inevitably, that's, there's a hit for us uh, to our balance sheet, to our income, but um, actually we think that was, yeah, completely the right thing to do um, and also the quickest thing we could do in terms of helping organizations preserve cash uh, was simply to, to stop asking for, for repayments at that point. Um, I think the second bit on the grant side of thing is worth saying we're, we're a strategic partner to access um, to also power to change who are a big um, uh, grant funder of community businesses in the UK um, and also as part of the Youth Endowment Fund, which um, is a big program, a grant fund addressing serious youth violence. Um, and on each of those, we've also responded with emergency grants rounds um, and working with those partners again to, to, get, to get money fast and as streamlined as possible to the organisations that need it. And worth saying that because the, the scale of the need is such that I think there's been a real need for a multiple, um, a plural, a number of interventions really, and, and we've been part of that. I think the third bit I just wanted to say before I move on is um, we've also been trying to assess data from our own portfolio. So we've been um, using a sort of uh, consistent format to, to assess the data, both financial viability, um, which groups and sectors are being hit hardest and so on, so that we can better analyze um, who we who we need to help, uh, who needs help most urgently, and um, and in what ways, and also how we can inform 
our responses to the emergency and the potential recovery as well. So we've been partly looking data-wise at our own customer base and sharing that, and you can read more about that on our website, um, but also looking at the economic impact in the country. Um, and again, we've had a, a partnership with um, a media agency that's been sharing uh, assessments of retail income and spend to get a sense of the impact economically. So again, really trying to think about how is our sector being affected, but also how are, how are society and our economy being affected. Um, and the scale of need is extraordinary. So, you know, we knew that anything we were going to do was not going to, was not going to be able to help everyone. Um, and you'll have seen, certainly if you're in the UK, the, the, the amount of calls for interventions for funding, um, not just from the charity sector, but almost from every part of industry and business. Um, to give you one indication of that, one grants uh, program we've been running uh, was running on a registration basis. So the first 150 organizations to register uh, got through into the window, the first window we've been doing three rounds and, and that closed after 44 seconds. Uh, the second time we ran the round, it, it took a, a lethargic four minutes. Um, so the demand is, is enormous. Um, and our, our data would say that roughly two thirds of those organizations we support have a, a medium to high risk, both of their current income and to their reserves and cash position. Um, all of which is background and context, I think, for, the, for why we established the Resilience and Recovery Loan Fund. And I'll just touch on a, a few of those reasons. Partly, um, Sunke mentioned uh, C-Bills, which is a sort of acronym that I've become worryingly familiar with. So a government scheme, coronavirus business interruption loan scheme, um, which provides basically a guarantee um, up to 80% uh, of a deal uh, and up to 60%, which is then the lifted uh, of a portfolio um, against losses. So the government effectively guaranteeing and also paying uh, the fees, any arrangement fees and interest in the first year of that loan. Um, what we were hearing was that a lot of charities and social enterprises were finding these difficult to access. Partly that was just about the sheer volume of demand hitting mainstream banks. Um, partly that was a bit of mainstream banks and institutions not understanding that sector very well. Um, partly it was um, due to just to poor accessibility and lack of uh, eligibility as well. Um, and as it turned out, we were we were about 95% of the way through getting credited by the British Business Bank, which is how you get to be a provider for, for this scheme. So we accelerated that in conversation with Big Society Capital, who um, then provided us with uh, 25 million uh, to start off the fund and uh, to try and uh, respond in a in a manner which was which we felt was necessary to a bunch of organizations that weren't being um, tailored to um, I think the other bit we we were aware of is that we couldn't do this alone we did not have the capacity and capability to do that many assessments for a fund to to also reach out to as broad a network of organizations as possible so we engaged with initially three delivery partners, and, and we, we, we will probably add more in the next few weeks, um, but initially big, big issue invest charity bank and SASC. And it's worth pausing and just saying that alongside obviously legal colleagues like Bates Wells, who helped us enormously, you know, this was an enormous team effort to get this established and get this running. Um, normally, I think probably a fund like this would take us about six months and we did it in about six weeks. And we simply couldn't have done that without huge assistance from each of those organizations, particularly Big Society Capital, who at times it felt like effectively seconded one or two people to, to my team for, for work on this fund, but also the partners who helped us construct something that we all felt could work and we could all deliver to. Um, if you go to the next slide, and then I'll just touch on the fund itself. So as I mentioned, we've got 25 million pounds in the fund to start. We are fundraising um, and got some initial funds uh, committed from some charitable foundations and their endowments, uh, so that looks to grow a little. We've started with 100,000 to 500,000 pound loans. Um, again, we knew this would uh, restrict who we were able to help. Um, this was for a range of reasons, partly the growth fund, which um, was mentioned earlier, was tailoring to that below 100k market in the UK, and since then, government has also announced something called the Bounce Back Loan Scheme, which, which does smaller loans as well. Um, partly, we also felt that many of the grant programs were uh, supporting smaller organizations 
and understandably smaller organizations particularly have working with vulnerable uh, people and groups affected by covid um, and that actually there are a bunch of medium-sized organizations um, across a wide range of sectors that were that were being hit as well so that's why we started with those um, levels uh, a three-year term partly because we felt that largely this should be for cash flowing and working capital of viable business models that have genuinely been interrupted. Um, and as I mentioned, fee free and interest fee for 12 months, uh, six and a half percent thereafter, um, which is in line or below most social investment um, without security. And I suppose the other thing worth mentioning is that we try to really streamline the process. So to give you an indication, we have weekly investment committees. Each of our partners has a meeting ahead of those investment committees. The papers then come back and we turn around the minutes after the committee meeting within a day and try and get the approvals processed the next week. Um, to that end, the assessment is, is um, streamlined. It's like a four page uh, assessment and we're trying to make that as simple as possible. Um, I think that seems to be working okay. What we've built into the, the fund is uh, a monthly review, um, which we're doing at the moment, which looks at are we meeting the right needs? Are we being complementary to what's out there? Um, and, and really actually is our comms right? Are we, are we reaching out? Do we need to add more partners? Do we need to do more marketing and so on and so forth? So really trying to keep it under fairly constant review. Um, and the reason for that, I suppose, to come to my final sort of two or three points is, is partly because, um, well, actually it's been incredibly difficult to judge demand. <laughs> And that's partly because everything has been changing. Um, so to give you an indication, when we started uh, piecing the fund together, uh, there was a, a trading requirement of 50%. So basically charities or social enterprises would have to earn at least 50% of their income through trading to take part in the scheme. Um, that was then lifted um, uh, about two weeks after we started designing the fund. Um, and that's led to some really interesting charities coming through who are actually seeking a loan to see them over until their fundraising uh, events or uh, legacies can get through probate and other aspects. So not the traditional trading models that we would see. As I mentioned, there's also been constant additions of new funds. Um, so both from the charity sector itself, from foundations, from the lottery, money coming from government. Um, um, but also from government itself, the bounce back loan scheme I mentioned, um, and also other other interventions and, and government programs themselves. So the furlough scheme, which has allowed um, people to, you know, have people off work, but paid for still by government. Again, originally that ran till June, um, and we anticipated some loans being to pay for the bridge to furlough payments, but actually that's now extended till October. And so we've been in this kind of, um, uh, environment of consistent change where it's very really difficult to judge demand and difficult to keep it um, complementary to what's happening and that's been probably the biggest challenge for us. Um, the second bit I think which is a, a different dilemma to the one that was probably intended in the, the webinar has been about the extent to which we put our resources into the emergency response and the extent to which we also think ahead to the recovery. Um, so there's but simply there's a huge amount we don't know and um, but I guess what we do know is that there will be as much demand and as much need for finance and support of different types in the in the recovery in whatever way that looks like depending on how we come out of this um, as there has been in the emergency response and I guess we're we're one of a number of organizations though we've been part of that emergency response um, we are aware that there's the potential for some of that to if you like push some of the challenges three to six months along the line um, and there are some potential dangers to that so I think we're also thinking ahead based on the data I talked about earlier about how do we how do we sensibly build uh, the right packages of support and finance for the recovery as well as the uh, emergency response and then the final thing I'll say and then um, we can see if there are any questions um, if not I'll, uh, I'll I'll hand over to Martin um, just on impact, really, because because colleagues from Bates Wells talked about that a little. I mean, we've kept it incredibly simple and quite high level on this fund. You know, frankly, the way we viewed it is this is not the time to ask for incredibly detailed um, impact metrics. 
Um, actually, what we're focusing on is the enterprise level impact. So are we helping these organizations be more viable and survive and sustain? Um, we're capturing some very top level uh, data about sectors and about beneficiary groups, but uh, very minimal. And the loan agreement actually says specifically that we won't ask for any any impact uh, data or documentation that they aren't already uh, creating themselves. So that's just one area where we've tried to keep uh, the process as streamlined and as simple as we can, uh, notwithstanding the, the complications of being part of a big government scheme uh, and taking money from external investors. So those are some of the things we've been juggling. Um, and I hope that is um, a helpful overview and very happy to take um, any questions. Uh, Gail, do, are there any questions for me before I hand over to Martin? No, no questions in the question panel. Anything from the panelists themselves? Um, hi, Nick. <laughs> um, so, um, one thing which, um, as we were working with Sib on, um, on on the loan fund, was something which I always found really interesting and would love to get your thoughts on. Um, given the nature of the actual charities and social enterprises that will be applying for this fund, the possibility of defaults is necessarily going to be quite high. Um, so uh, it would be great to get your thoughts i know that this will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis of some of the high level principles of how you will deal with kind of borrower defaults and kind of the recovery process particularly if you are going to get commercial lenders to buy in and enter into as um uh, lenders to sib under this fund the kind of key things that those commercial lenders need to be aware of and, and need to be comfortable with um to kind of preserve the mission and values and how you intend to treat your investees yeah it's a you know this from too well so so that's a very difficult question um yeah because there's, there's a great deal we don't know i mean i suppose what i would say is from our experience and track record you know we've been running effectively government back funds for almost 20 years and actually effectively we've been running at times you know portfolios that are in distress cases that are in in challenge and um i think we we would intend to take quite a customer focused approach to that um i think you know we what the guarantee gives us is it gives us slightly more flexibility on that front you know effectively we've we've modeled this on on a, expecting a high level of, of rice offs and defaults um higher than we would normally anticipate and um and therefore the kind of expectations of return to to our investors are that much lower um so we try to be as as um, as thoughtful and as cautious as we can, and keep the customer at the front of our minds, really. Um, and the second bit is that we will, yeah. What's been very challenging, I guess, is to have any sense of um, how these loans and these organisations might perform in the next three to five years. I mean, if anyone has a great uh, sense of that at this point, I would welcome it. Um, it's made it's made modelling, for example, portfolio management and other aspects really really challenging actually because you know we may be coming out into a recession we may be coming out to a series of phased lockdowns that may affect different sectors differently um we, we're starting to get some better sense of the sectors where there's opportunity as well where they're, they're coming under increased um requests for their services um but also those uh, inevitably often those with footfall in their business model who've been who've been more affected um but yes, a challenge to do. I guess our, our process is always to put the customer first. Um, and I think with the investors we have on board and the expectations and the transparency we've operated within, then I think we can we can do that quite well, even even with so many unknowns in the in the future. I'm not sure if I add anything else. I'm scrolling through my question panel. Uh, I think somebody's asking if there's various things that are public. I'm happy to share uh, any of the tools and things that have gone into making the fund and any any of our impact assessment work as well. Um, so happy to happy to share that via EP, EVPA afterwards if that's if that's helpful. And we have another question, Nick, on what level of defaults are you planning for from Shamsher? <laughs> yeah, well, we to be very open, we've modelled it on. Um, around 40 percent defaults so quite high um 
Uh, so to give you an indication, I suppose a couple of our other big funds, Future Builders, which is a big fund that we still manage, was an expected sort of write-off and de default rate of around 15%. So we're anticipating a high a high level here. Um, to be honest, though, that's I mean there was there were some assumptions that went into that, but some of that is a is estimate and uh, informed guesswork, I guess, as much as anyone is is being able to do at the moment. So. Um, we will see whether that pans out. I hope it doesn't. Um, and I, I hope it proves stronger than that and that we can do different things with the money and, and potentially reinvest it back in the sector. But um, that's what we're, we're planning based on. Thanks, Thanks, Nick. I think we'll move on to our next speaker then. Great, thank you. Great, well, uh, yeah, thanks, Nick. Really helpful um, hearing more about resilient and recovery loan. So thank you for that. Thank you all as well for just making time uh, to uh, join this. I'm going to try and move uh, fairly quickly through what I've got to say, uh, just to uh, try and create a bit of space for questions at the end, which I think there will be some. So um, let me introduce uh, Resonance briefly and uh, just what we're talking about. If we move on to the next slide. So, um, Residents, you know, we've been uh, trading and growing for 18 years, I think, and very much energized by um, the vision of a world where capital serves people and communities and where resources are stewarded well. And um, I would say, you know, generally, despite the incredibly challenging situation for uh, a lot of our investees and the like, we've we've remained encouraged at least, and maybe sometimes optimistic as well, as we've seen new things happening. And that's really because we've been very much uh, encouraged and empowered uh, by the relationships that we have with others. So um, just to talk a little bit about, this isn't a lecture at all, but um, just this idea of uh, kind of soft capital and uh, some of the social capital that we've seen, and I'll weave that into some of what we, uh, think about as we look at maybe a range of examples rather than a single case study. Um, but for us, we've seen organisations within the sector working uh, well together and um, that kind of bonding uh, within sector groups, we've been really encouraged by lots and lots of organisations ready to step up and do differently and talk more and uh, collaborate and the like. Um, we've also been really encouraged and I think this is one of the things we uh, hold as a value within resonance that we want to act as a bridge uh, for people not uh, not an institution you know we are we generally work from the basis we will find a solution and we'll do that through building relationships and and trying to s find results which work for uh, not only for us as a, an impact investor but also for our investees so that bridging has been really important uh, to us and I've got an example uh, we'll talk about where we've seen some of that uh, stuff happening really well. And then we've also, I think, had some opportunities to um, try and build um, links that feel like they stretch a bit further. And uh, that for me is some of the interesting stuff. I, my role is head of impact uh, and innovation. So impact is uh, what all of our investees are busy with, but the innovation is sometimes thinking bigger thoughts. And that's uh, there's been opportunity for that in this uh, time as well. Let's move on and uh, just talk a little bit about uh, collaboration particularly. So um, like many, you know, we've been changed by this uh, current uh, period of uh, crisis. So some of our staff have been furloughed. Um, and although we had a very few people within the organization taking every other Friday off, um, just because they chose to, uh, we've actually encouraged uh, staff to work four and a half days out of five. So many staff uh, within the organization are now working nine days out of 10. That's not been without its challenges. Uh, when you're very busy, it's hard to do, but it's also been part of us just um, uh, setting our you know, sail to suit the, uh, the breeze kind of thing and trimming our cloth or whatever the... Uh, example is so that's been something that we've done as an organization then with our investees um we have been working hard i think you heard this uh, from bates well as well um you know catch cash flowing out the door for any organization at this point is uh, really challenging so we've been working with them and as 
uh, within our enterprise growth funds and uh, we've already sat down and uh, agreed and pre-approved both capital and interest deferral so um we try to always fit that to each situation we know it's not a blanket solution um <clears throat> i would say that we've seen about a 50 percent uptake uh on those reliefs that's um maybe partly about mix, uh, partly maybe about the fact that some of our investees are, have seen growth in demand uh, during this uh, time. So care, uh, home food delivery, all sorts of things like that, we've seen growth in demand. And uh, I think just um, finally, you know, those of you that uh, know Dan Brewer, our chief exec, will know that he's uh, a great communicator and lobbyer, and uh, we've been busy with that as well, of course. Um, as uh, running a number of uh, SITR social impact effects relief funds, we recognise there are uh, changes coming potentially for that, so we've been lobbying on that front. But the communicating and coordinating that's gone on for us has felt uh, really uh, valuable. And uh, we've actually seen, I think within our organisation and around it, we've seen some of that getting um, actually stronger rather than weaker during this time. So the uh, geography has become a bit less important with us working uh, from home, but the relationships have been really key in doing that. And uh, one example where we are trying to bring specific uh, solutions to the market would be something which is still uh, an idea, um, but we are talking about a community property protector fund, which, uh, would be a way of protecting community uh, enterprises for the communities that they serve so that they some of them are um, at risk of losing a key asset a building um, because they can't um, make payments so uh, power to change uh, mentioned by nick earlier uh, they estimate that 43 percent of uh, community enterprises have lost the majority of their income so <clears throat> You know, if you've got a substantial asset which is uh, reliant on footfall uh, to uh, create your impact, that's a really big issue for you. So we've been talking about how can we uh, raise uh, capital to allow essentially a sale and lease back type of uh, arrangement. We do that uh, while we're still talking about the idea. Very happy to have conversations with others about uh, that, but. Uh, would uh, offer to buy a property from um, a social enterprise or from the landlord uh, in exchange for um, some sort of agreement around uh, rent-free period and um, giving the enterprise the opportunity to um, buy back in if they wanted to repurchase at a set price or whatever it was and where we can structure um, some follow-on investment uh, into that as well. So just really recognizing that there are particular issues there and we may be able to do something uh, interesting. We're uh, working out how we can manage the exits for investors and the like, but uh, that might well allow community enterprises to go on making an impact at this uh, point. So that's one of the areas where uh, we think that the mileage in um, developing a fund specifically to help organizations in that distress state. But um, very happy to have more conversation about that uh, at another time, of course, as well. Let's move on and uh, talk a little bit about some of the creative responses uh, that we can make. So I have uh, spent some of my working life uh, working in French, and one of the ideas I like in French is this idea of accompagnement, uh, which is something like walking alongside, but it doesn't uh, quite work in English. Um, but the, the re close relationships that we've had have been a real birthplace for the question, how might we solve this need? How might we uh, work together? And uh, those conversations have led us into some creative uh, opportunities. I think one of the things that's really encouraged us is these really small grants, uh, 5,000 uh, pounds to organizations that are trying, trying to stay uh, connected with their client base. You know, if they've been used to face-to-face -face delivery, Jump with Joe is uh, one example in the southwest of England, where, uh, you know, normally that would be a face-to-face -face activity uh, with kids um, helping them exercise and the like. You know, that's moved to uh, some sort of online delivery and uh, 
building up uh, work that way. But uh, even a small grant for an organization like that has been really impactful. And I think interestingly for us, also suggests that um, there might be opportunity to do some sort of digital pivot uh, for them and for other organizations like them. Dangerous Dad's another example where, you know, they've moved some of their activity online, uh, which is a new environment for them. But the support uh, they've had from us and others uh, has been part of uh, helping them uh, develop a response um, where they are an event-based organization to the current uh, situation. I think um, as well another example I can share with you which uh, I've been really encouraged by is um, we had a conversation internally about well <clears throat> can we can we help by you know getting more vehicles available for um, the increased food distribution that's been happening so you know lots of home delivery of um, either ready meals or shopping but in fact the issue isn't uh, transport the issue is um, coordination and so we've seen a growing opportunity for uh, social enterprises to uh, work together. The, um, there's an organisation called Open Food Network uh, in the UK, 500 local uh, food organisations. They have seen a 750% increase in their um, volume going through their network since the start of uh, COVID-19. So massive increases. And um, on... Uh, structures and organizations which are have been working up to now as individual organizations with their own van so there's a pilot project uh, being developed at the moment in the southwest again to uh, look at how we can really build some of the uh, coordination network behind that uh, sort of operation such as small uh, operators don't necessarily have to have all of the um, logistical and operational infrastructure behind them but can collaborate together so that's also about building more resilient uh, networks and uh, futures where they can be more impactful because their scale comes from working alongside others and just finally um, before uh, finish and uh, give you the chance to ask about any of those ideas or others um, we've also been working on some of the um, more innovative um, bits of the possible solution to this uh, difficult situation. One of those uh, has been thinking um, about how we do respond uh, to organizations that see uh, their scarce cash uh, flowing out the door rather too fast. And we have um, worked to uh, develop, we're just in the early stages of uh, putting together uh, pilot, again, probably piloting in the Southwest where we've got a really good set of relationships with uh, social enterprises down there to uh, allow them to uh, trade uh, with each other and with other SMEs and maybe uh, local authorities on a non-cash uh, basis. So what would that look like is the quite one of the questions we're asking at the moment and working hard to uh, try and uh, resolve. But it will be, I think, based on uh, local uh, trusted networks it will be something that we can federate to uh, scale but again that's uh, just an area where we recognize that the uh, solution may be for organizations to work differently both now and into the future and there are certainly examples of that elsewhere in the world where um, non-cash trading has worked really well to help develop um, more resilient uh, local uh, organizations and infrastructures so that's uh, me done. I'm very happy to take questions on that uh, or to, of course, hear uh, from others. So we have uh, one question in the panel. Thank you very much, Martin, which is uh, again from Shamsher. And he says, do you think there will be a higher propensity to bundle more assets based asset based bundles with services for investors or protection in the future? I think, um, I'm not sure I know the answer to that, um, but I do think that um, when assets are um, a way of helping an organization uh, deliver the impact it wants to uh, create, that they could uh, potentially be um, uh, yeah, fitted, fitted together differently. So, you know, we know those small uh, food organizations um, doing distribution, they're, uh, impact is not necessarily um, 
um, enhanced by the fact they've got to operate a warehouse. You know, we know other people who can operate warehouses better than them or who can maybe hold the asset or whatever. So I do think there's opportunity to think more uh, creatively about uh, all of those areas. And I think we may see some changes as people look harder at um, what helps them uh, really add their own distinctive uh, value and impact to what their organization is trying to do. Thanks for that, Martin. I think we're going to move uh, into the group question, answer, and discussion. So this will be a lot more interactive. Peter, maybe you want to mention some of the rules? That makes it sound very grand. So um, thank you to all the panelists uh, so far. I mean, really, the this group discussion is really to hear from, from the audience and to bring out some of those themes. On a practical level, um, we're going to try and use the, the raise hand feature uh, on, on the GoToWebinar. Um, so if you do have any thoughts or any ideas, please do raise a hand, a bit like being back at school, and then uh, Gail can help to, to unmute you. It's, it's nothing to do with control, it's just otherwise we end up with quite bad audio. So, so that's the, the reason behind that. Um, but maybe whilst uh, that's, you're, you're giving some thought to that, I don't know if maybe uh, any of the panellists or Louise, I think you had a question possibly. Um, yeah, so I think this is sort of a, a one for the general discussion. And so we've heard heard about the other support that's been offered by residents and, and by SID, um, things like the streamlined processes, weekly investment committees, um, and some of the innovations by residents as well about um, sell and leasebacks. And it'd just be interested to hear from anyone else in the audience about any best practice that you are implementing or seeing, um, really tangible ideas about how you're helping to get cash flow into businesses or how you as an organization are sort of riding out this cash flow crisis and i would just add to that whilst we're, we're waiting on on the the responses I, I i was also interested to hear from from martin about this being a, a time for innovation and and kind of space but i i wonder how easy it is to balance finding the time when when investees are under real pressure and um, we do have a danger in the impact uh, economy of turning up and, and asking for time uh, quite a lot of the time uh, to talk about innovation, but it, it's interesting to see where that balance and if anyone else is starting to see those opportunities for innovation as well would be quite an interesting one to hear from. I mean, I think the only the only thing I'd add to that, I think Martin's right. I mean, I think what's been, I sort of jokingly said that we've done a fund in six weeks that should have taken six months. I mean, I think that it's it is true though i mean i don't think we would have been able to do that i don't think the funders and investors would have acted with the pace they have maybe not even the lawyers uh and um and i think it's what we have seen is people prepared to overcome some of the sort of restrictions or barriers whether deliberate or cultural or technical that that are normally in place and um so i, I hope that that sort of sense of collective purpose and um yeah, willingness to to be flexible and adaptable is something that we carry forward. I, mean, I think that's the sort of stuff that Martin was talking about that that residents do very naturally themselves as well. But I think we've also seen it in across organisations and and between organisations as well. Uh, yeah, I, I'd, I'd second that. Certainly, taking it one step back from an EVPA point of view, we've seen a lot of willingness to to cooperate amongst. Um, Possibly across old institutional egos as well, where where big organisations used to work alongside each other, and so from from an EVPA point of view, we see that in launching cross European panels with with some of our peers that that just wouldn't have happened in the time period or with the appetite prior to this possibly. So it's a it's a positive to take out from an otherwise slightly negative situation. We have a question from Sophie, so I'm just going to unmute her. Sophie, you have to unmute yourself. Yep. All right. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gail. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. Uh, it was the most interesting. Uh, I'm uh, EVP lead for France, and uh, uh, very interesting that uh, everything what that was shared uh, resonates very well with the what's going on in with the impact uh, investors community in France. So I have a question for Nick and Martin. Um, obviously, all this uh, financial support, as well as our 
non-financial support, Martin, I like your accompaniment uh, as we say in French. Uh, uh, this uh, this uh, when you 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 have all the board, how was it uh, to to commit your strategy in, the, in this new era that we all see? So right, you go that Martin. <laughs> We couldn't really hear you well, Sophie. I think it might be a connection problem. Um, maybe you could write it down in the chat or the question. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, great. So while Sophie writes her question in the chat, is there anyone else who has a question? I hope you can see the the option to raise your hand and then I can unmute you. But if not, if you feel if you're still a little shy, feel free to also use either the chat box or the questions box and we'll take those questions as well. Meanwhile, maybe there's another question from one of our panelists. Oh, sorry. I think you might sorry, be on mute. I think you're really as well. <laughs> All right, thank you, Fair Fed to me now. Um, so my question is um, for Martin and Nick, and also for uh, the rest of the roundtable. Um, in terms of your kind of strategy of trying to be creative and flexible and dealing with your investees, um, it'd be good to kind of hear your thoughts on what you have encountered as some of your biggest challenges, or what you foresee to be some of your biggest challenges in. In, in trying to implement that in terms of managing various stakeholders, pressure from investors, um, or maybe it's just the uncertainty, but it would be good to, to kind of get your thoughts on, on what you see as perhaps the future hurdles and how you might um, respond to those. Do you want to go first, Martin? <laughs> well, uh, thanks. Nick's absolutely right, of course, that, um, you know, as investors, there's a real danger that we come in with our solutions. Uh, and uh, actually just distract organizations that are busy uh, trying to both deliver impact and survive very challenging times. But uh, we have been uh, really encouraged, I think, by some uh, opportunities have been to uh, think new thoughts. And um, I've, we've been amazed really by how some very small um, nudges sometimes can uh, start uh, you know, sometimes it's just a well-placed question by one of our investment managers as they work alongside uh, an investee, um, helping unlock and open up new thinking and new approaches. And I think I can see in that opportunity to actually do differently in the future as well, which is uh, very encouraging. Yeah, I, I think I agree. And I, I mean, I think for us, it's probably will move from what I'd call a sort of blanket approach to something a bit more targeted i mean i think we we just responded as quickly as we could and gave our team the the option as i'm sure residents did when they were ringing around the customers and getting in touch um to, to have that flexibility and to offer that i think as time goes on and um the sort of different scenarios play out we'll get a clearer picture of which which types of organizations of which scale which business model maybe working with different groups are most affected um so that could be everything from social enterprises that employ people from a vulnerable background and how does the furloughing scheme affect them particularly do they need more time to come out of that that's something i know social enterprise uk have been talking about it could be that it's a footfall model that we talked about earlier it could be that it's multidisciplinary it could be that um actually it's been public sector and they've the government's actually been paying quite well generally um does that continue as, as local authorities and councils run into to more challenges themselves. So there's a, just a, a wide range of questions. And I think for us, we'll just try to keep keep in touch with the customer base and keep on top of the data to try and inform how we respond to it. But using very similar tools to the ones Martin outlined, you know, emergency grants, bridging loans, 
uh, flexibility around repayments and um, and just trying to to provide uh, non-financial support where it's helpful as well. So I, I also have a question uh, by proxy by one of the attendees um, and on behalf of Tom Hoyle, who's uh, as part of this new COVID situation, also having to balance uh, homeschooling with with working. Um, and so his question was. Um, before the crisis, um, we saw periodic pushes for mergers and acquisitions, amongst, especially amongst charities and social enterprises. And a, a complaint often raised that mergers were only happening when one party was close to insolvency. Is merging or more benignly cooperation collaboration between related organisations a consideration in current structuring or non-financial support? Shall I, go, shall I start? I was looking at Martin. I hope he starts. Um, I, I mean, I think. Uh, look, we've 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 actually been we've done several mergers and um, collaborations within our existing portfolio previously. As you say, often they're not mergers of equals; they're absorptions or takeovers by by another name. If we're being honest, I mean, I think. Um, I think there's, there's the potential for that, but also I think the challenge, which we referred to earlier, is this sort of time poverty. So, I mean, I think, you know, what I do know from working on some of those and collaborations and mergers is they take a huge amount of time and effort and capacity. And if there's one thing that very few organizations have right now, it's it's that. So, so yes, in the sense that in the kind of, in my earlier sort of nothing's off the table now, then, then we might see some more of that. I think the challenge will be finding the time, particularly for smaller organisations. I just think it's going to be very difficult for them to find the time and energy and effort to to do that really. So we may see some, but equally we may see at, um, even you know at our sort of level as well. There's, there's a, you know, we may see more collaboration and consolidation at, in different parts of the sector as well, not just necessarily in the frontline um, delivery organisations. Yeah, I'd um, I'd add to that. I think there's um, there are real opportunities, and maybe more so in this sector than in others, uh, to think different. So, uh, you know, we're so used to uh, living and working in this very competitive paradigm, you know, evidenced by Nick and his 44 seconds to first uh, close, you know, um, on uh, funding. But uh, there are real opportunities for collaboration. And I think uh, sometimes there's a role for uh, financial intermediaries and investors uh, and others uh, who have a bit more of a helicopter view to say to organisations, you know, you could work collaboratively and that might or might not uh, create a structural legal change. Um, it doesn't always have to, but uh, it might be that actually that's the best way forward. So I think we've probably not seen as much of that in this sector as could uh, usefully strengthen uh, the sector. Okay, um, I'll move on to Sophie's question actually that she wrote down. So her question goes to, par um, to Martin and Paul. She asks, how is this new way of supporting the investees making you rethink your long-term investment strategies in this new era or the post-crisis which is ahead of us? So um, I'll um, respond uh, initially. And just briefly, uh, as uh, others on this call will know, uh, when you've got money to deploy, um, that can feel like uh, an imperative, just getting it out the door, uh, particularly in a short time scale. That's very challenging. But I think for um, us, one of the approaches we're trying to develop is a slightly more integrated um, approach, which says we will move from the earliest due diligence phases uh, uh, through investment committee and into the ongoing uh, management of impact with the organization in such a way that um, we uh, just build a slightly more um, coherent approach really to all of that and I think that might be part of the uh, answer to that. Yeah I think I mean I think for us um, some of it is um, I think what is more done actually is probably accelerate existing plans if I to be honest so i think we'd already been thinking that a guarantee was a, was a more sensible um thing to use in a in a heavily debt-based market um i'm as big a fan of sitr as others and was involved in bringing it to bear but i think it's it's 
it's difficult because it's based more on an equity model. Um, I think residents have done an amazing job and, and done better than anyone else. But um, I think I think we need to. It's it's certainly accelerated that for us. I think the other bit that's accelerated is the use of data internally for us to to really inform what we do next um, and to hopefully influence what the whole the whole sector does. Um, then the third bit I think is is just some of the learning that we've had previously. So, you know, I think we knew that uh, a range of different options were needed to suit people. I think we knew that different areas of the country were being affected more. And I think we we probably also knew that you know quite patient, flexible, um, uh, often subsidised um, investment was needed in a lot of those places to to level it up. However, that's done, and I think we're all we're all looking at different ways of doing that and I think you know that's only going to be even more the case um, when we come out of lockdown and come into whatever whatever phases of, of life we're about to enter into. Thank you both. We have a raised hand so I'm just going to go ahead Madeline. Hello Madeline Clark here from Genio in Ireland. Um, very interesting discussion. Thanks for organising Peter and the EVPA team. I have a question for Martin. It's a specific question. I had the pleasure of meeting your CEO at an EVPA meeting some time ago and was interested in your affordable housing work, Martin. We're having a, a lot of conflicting trends in the housing sector here in Ireland and I'm just wondering what, how's, how has the situation impacted, if any yet, uh, the work you're doing on affordable housing in residence. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so some of you will know uh, we've got a fair chunk of money uh, in uh, affordable housing and uh, providing uh, solutions for uh, homelessness uh, with charity partners. Practically, uh, we've had some challenges. So um, in the UK, uh, there's been a lockdown on um, conveyancing and just uh, you know we've had situations where um, uh, legal papers have been passed through windows you know at an appropriate social distance just to get deals done um, but that has uh, is starting to change again now so I think we're expecting to see that pick up but uh, we've also got uh, conversations going on about how we can um, respond well to the uh, imminent crisis at least in the UK where those that have been uh, rough sleeping or um, have been housed in closed hotels, and you know, responding to the question what will happen to them as uh, the economy starts to uh, restart, you know, will they just be uh, put out on their ears? And particularly young people, we see a specific need for uh, better solutions for um, affordable housing for young people, and those coming out of care as well. So we're very aware of that. We don't have um, all the answers, but are definitely up for conversations with others about how to do that well. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm aware we've, we're coming quite close to, to the end of the session and the, the one uh, most important job for the grandly titled chair is to make sure everyone finishes on time. So I'm, um, in order to score 10 out of 10 on every satisfaction survey, I, I would just suggest um, we could uh, bring it to a halt uh, at this point. Um, obviously, there will be other questions and thoughts and happy to continue this discussion uh, as we on, go on. Um, on a practical note from uh, our side, we will be following up with all the attendees with, a, with some of the simple summaries and a recording of, of this webinar, but, but it, it really just strikes me that it's, it's a debate and a question that we should be having and, and talking about more as we go along. So um, I was just going to take this opportunity to thank uh, all the panellists and the case studies. So Louise and Hung-Soo from, from Bates and, and Martin and Nick uh, from the case studies, which have made it a very interesting session, certainly for me. Um, and, and unless anyone has any uh, burning comments, I would just suggest that we uh, wish you all a very good day and hope to speak to you again soon. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye now.